Please welcome the Together Live family, Jennifer Rudolph Walsh, Cameron Esposito, Amina Brown, Sabrina Jalice, Connie Lim, Michael Trotter Jr. and Tanya Blount Trotter. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Jennifer Rudolph Walsh. And we're the Together Live family. And what Together Live is, is a traveling love rally, really. We go to town to town. Um, over the last five years, we've seen 50,000 people that way. We pack up our bags, we leave our children and our pets and our partners, and we go to people's towns because we believe collectively in our hearts that authentic storytelling has magic powers. We honestly believe that it has the power to connect and heal and even elevate us. And I love Not Done because I think that what's not done where storytelling is concerned is telling the truth. We gotta keep coming closer and instead of wondering what's wrong with that person, wonder what happened, what happened to you? And share your own brave truth and, dra and bravely reach out other people's truths from them. And so that's what we've been doing for these last five years. And even though you're seeing musicians and comedians and poets on this stage, what I'm seeing are these giant hearts with these incredible stories of courage and resilience um, that I've been so lucky to have shared with me. So I'm gonna get to the sharing now and start by asking each one of you to just tell me what's the mantra that's currently getting you out of bed, out of the house, you know, into, into the bathtub or into work, whatever it is, what's the thing that's getting you going? My favorite mantra right now is make room, make space uh, in my schedule, for my hair, for my body, for the voices that we need to hear more of. Make room, make space. Love that. Thank you. Uh, mine is, uh, lately has been Procter and Gamble. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I want sponsorship, though. I, uh, <laughs> my mantra is just be you. That's the real one, because for a long time, I thought I was too brown uh, to be an actor or to be cast in anything or too gay. Um, and now that I've been cast in a sitcom, I'm like, oh, I'm just gay and brown enough. Should have been me all along. I guess being me is working out just okay. Thanks to Procter & Gamble. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. <laughs> um, I've been living by, uh, well, the time is now. And the time for me is to let go. Let go of control, let go of pain, and let go of this idea that it's all my fault. Wow, that's very, very powerful. Thank you. Tanya? Oh, mine is love like there's no tomorrow. Love because that. we never know. Love that. Thank you. Mine is when in doubt, build the catalog out. And a little bit of context as an artist sometimes I'll release something and I'll be searching for that validation outside. But ultimately, it's about the craft and, and, and the process of building that catalog of songs and loving that regardless of what others think. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Hello, group of people in a hotel. Um, <laughs> Oh my God, that's my mantra too. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just first want to say, you know, I, I just feel like really good right now. And I love the, the attire was business chic, but you don't know my business isn't train conducting. So <laughs> I just feel very strong and powerful <laughs> in my outfit choice. Um, I just needed to say that to you that I feel very proud of myself. Um, <laughs> and uh, my, my mantra has long been, hold the door open, which really, I was upset with Game of Thrones for a minute when they sort of encroached, but um, you know, as a queer person um, that's also gender non-conforming and, and on the masculine side and this haircut and walking through the world, there are so many times that the door has been closed to me and also as a white person, as somebody who went to college and my parents paid for it, there are so many times that I have gotten through the door. And so my personal mantra is if you get through the door, you hold the door open. Woo. 
for the other people who might have less privilege and who need to get through too. Yes. Done. Preach, preach, love that, love that, really love that. Mine is the two best times to plant a tree 25 years ago and today. So I always remind myself, yes, I should have done it then, but now, now, now. Yeah. So all very, all very inspiring. So Cameron, I'm gonna come back to you. And again, you know, the, the power of intersectional, intergenerational storytelling um, reveals that we all want the same things and we all feel heartbreak the same way. So you've shared uh, that you've recently gotten divorced um, and that that Wow, thanks, guys. Yeah, let's go right there. Yeah, let's go right there. You really dropped the ball. You didn't know what to do. They didn't yeah. know if they should clap. Should we clap? Yeah. <laughs> Whose choice was it? What do we do? Boo, I don't know. Uh, so tell me how you've married your childhood faith of Catholicism with your yeah. sort of emerging understanding of relationships and with the sadness that, that revolves around the end of a, of a relationship. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> Everybody's getting the exact same question, so. Everybody's, everybody has to talk about my divorce. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's, you know, it's complicated because some of you Cameron's don't have a lot of Cameron's divorce for me was hard. Um, um, no, you know, this is, this is tough for me to admit as an artist, but my parents are together and <laughs> have been together for 50 years and are super Catholic and there's no divorce in my family. I'm actually waiting to hear from the church what they think about my divorce because I know how they felt about my marriage, but I have yet to hear where they really stand on this. I'm just wondering if this is a moment where they're like, actually, we're, this is kind of a best case for us. And I am, like I said, waiting to hear from them. The church, that's an organization I really trust to tell me how I'm doing in my life. Um, because they've been nailing it, so. Actually, Jennifer, I told you backstage, my, my divorce was finalized last week and it was super Woo. painful to, you should, cl fuck you, you should clap. <laughs> it's terrible, it's not good, but just that's the right thing to do in terms of public speaking. Like it's not, um, it's an awful experience and I was very sad, um, but it also, I'm very, grateful to move through um, to the next phase because I will tell you, you know, I, I felt like I lost an identity, an identity that I fought for. I graduated from college in Massachusetts the same week that Massachusetts became the first state to legalize same-sex marriage. I graduated from a college where I could have been kicked out for being gay. So the same week, graduated, left, watched the first couples emerge victorious, hands over their, their head, and I thought that's what I want, you know, and the last year and a half as my marriage was falling apart, I just felt like I was grabbing at straws. You know, I took a spoon carving class. Oh my God. Just to be like, what do I, do I like to carve spoons? <laughs> what do I like? I didn't know what I liked. I dyed my hair, you know, I went, went all the way white, which looked amazing, but I had to add some color back in because men would not stop congratulating me on winning the World Cup. Um, <laughs> I had to let go of my dog, which felt awful. You know, most queer couples I know are dealing with an elaborate and court mandated pet visitation schedule. This is, we, we went with love is love when we fought for marriage equality. We should have been more, we should have said, but queer shit is specific. Cause I'm sitting now with a divorce lawyer who's like, what about kids? I'm like, we couldn't afford to buy kids. This is pets and. <laughs> Anyway, I had to give my dog up, but which is terribly sad. But just so you know, most traffic in every major city is just used stick shift Subarus carting dogs with hyphenated last names back and forth between vegetarian restaurants. That's what's happening. <laughs> I will cede the floor. Thank you for asking me this question, Jennifer. <laughs> God. You have to promise to let us know when you actually hear from the Catholic Church, though. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Milk, I know, she's a tough one to follow. Wow. Um, really? <laughs> so, but I was thinking about how you are the first person that told me that um, Chinese people are considered, considered the model immigrant. Is that a phrase that you shared with me? Right, the model minority. Model, model minority. And what kind of pressure that puts on you growing up to feel like there's only a certain amount of opportunities at the table for, for right. that. So can you share a story where that sort of created a limiting belief for you or where it was a freeing experience? Right, yeah. And then it's just to like give context with the, the existence as a model minority, um, 
is this expectation that we are, you know, good at assimilating. We are good at kind of succeeding in the, the structure that already exists. So, you know, in a way, it, it, it can seem convenient. So there's a privilege there because I can slide by in, in society and, and not be looked at as if I cause trouble. However, if I don't fit that min model minority, you know, uh, trope, then I almost feel like invisible because I don't know who I am. If and, and people expect that from me as a musician, it's also a weird thing because mu musicians are the trope is that we're rebellious or you know, and so it's just a really interesting divide that I kind of straddle um, how people perceive me. And growing up as as a young kid, my parents immigrated here from Hong Kong, and just really hardworking, great, wonderful parents. Um, when I grew up, my dad told me, you must work twice as hard and excel twice as much in order to maybe get a seat at the table. Um, and so I learned that very young. So I did like, we did extra homework. I had like extra homework books and like, you know, I was doing triple the work to just, cause I, had this idea of a, a table with a certain amount of seats. So this type of this type of idea, like I love that it kind of gave me this work ethic and maybe that's already been within me, but so I worked really hard and I learned how to work with myself. I learned how to learn well. Um, however, it created this like sense of scarcity and lack. So when I started pursuing music as my career, you know, it's already like considered a very competitive you know, that's the that's the image that it has. It's a competitive industry, few people make it. And as I was walking my path as a young artist in Los Angeles, if I had a friend that, you know, had a successful moment, outwardly I'd be like, that's amazing, congratulations. Internally I'd be like, no, you know. Um, having this nervousness and this anxiety, and I was like, I really don't wanna be, uh, I don't want to be that friend that is masking this almost like violent type of fear as someone's telling me something so beautiful. So I had to, um, I actually was curious about this idea of abundance. I was like, why do people talk about abundance? How can I believe in that? Because I really can't. Like there's something in me that just like my, my I hit a ceiling. You just really believe there was not enough to go around. Yes, and so I started meditating and you know, believe it or not, it was a Deepak Chopra meditation 21 day thing. And I listened to it over and over again for 63 days. I did the meditation three t times over. There was one thing that he said that flipped my, my brain. I was able to like rewire my neural, my, my neural pathways was he said that love, I can love Jen and I can love Amina and my love for Amina doesn't decrease my love for Jen. I don't know about Sabrina, but um, <laughs> <just kidding. laughs> um, and so I, a light bulb went off in my mind. <laughs> oh, very nice. That was very slick. A light bulb went off, and I said, "Oh, invisible forces, invisible resources like love are absolutely infinite and absolutely abundant. And using that resource, we all can have space to to get what we need." Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that. Thank you. Can you think of a time, Tanya, where um, in your life where you were healed or where you changed the story based on love, based on your, your ability to express yourself, whether it was through music or just through relationship? Definitely. Uh, Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm actually sitting here with my husband of 10 years now, and um, thank you. And something that I can remember so vividly, uh, one of the mantras that I actually have started living by, um, I guess within the last two or three years, it was something that Maya Angelou said, and she said that every storm runs out of rain. And I had come accustomed, since my parents had divorced when I was eight, to pain. You know, every relationship, you kind of figure out a way to make it a painful situation. And um, I remember meeting Michael, and uh, it was just like a light bulb that went off. 
this energy that he had when I met him. And uh, we started dating and we got married. And then we had a baby, but um, I guess within three years of us being married, I didn't know that he had suffered from PTSD and that he had been the, in the war. It was something that he was ashamed of and that he didn't tell me. And so we had an episode to happen, uh, one Fourth of July, and he had an episode. And I remember sitting there talking to him and saying, you just have to let me in, let me know what's going on. And as he started to let me into his story and tell me about what he'd gone through, he started writing songs. And those songs, I remember one song specifically, it was called Butterfly Beautiful, because we had shared each other's stories throughout this you know, three, year, three years in marriage at that time. And it just unfolded me. I mean, this song broke me down so much so that my one-year-old was crying. He was like, oh, oh mommy, it's beautiful. And I just remember all the layers that I had held in for all those years, this one song, just peeling back all the pain that I'd felt all, over the, all the years because I'd been giving so much to everybody and not realizing that that was just, a, I was deep, not really paying attention to the fact that there was something going on inside of me. You know, you can just keep giving and giving and giving, and that's a way of hiding as well. Right. And when I finally gave in to Michael and we started his healing process, I remember my healing process taking place. And it was the most beautiful experience I'd ever encountered, and it was called love. It wasn't called great sex, even though it was. But <laughs> I tell. But... It was love, and it unfolded me, and it freed me in a way where I could be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that was what I needed. I needed to understand that I could be vulnerable. And That's that I what could we all be need. An African American woman, soft, vulnerable, and feminine, <laughs> you know? And those are some of the images that we don't always see, but it melted my heart. Mm -hmm. And so love did that for me. Mm. You know, it's funny, we call those soft skills, but those are actually our strongest skills. Thank you. Oh, Michael, you said that you have to remind yourself that it's not your fault. So I have to ask, what do you mean by that? What's not your fault? You know, I had a, <clears throat> well, I guess I'll tell the other side of the uh, soldier story. Um, 2004, I went to the war and pain chose me. It chose me then. Uh, what do you do when, you know, you're standing in the midst of 986 soldiers and you connect with a couple and you share your dreams and goals after the military and you find a few who have the same as you. You know, I want to be a singer. Uh, I want to be in love. I want to, you know, be able to tell my war stories to my children. And um, out of 20 guys you meet, you connect with like that. What do you do when they all get killed and you're the only one standing there? How do you not accept pain? How do you not accept the fact that as an American soldier, that is, that's your fault? And now you live with that. Um, I, I learned that it's called moral, moral injury. And yeah. Say it again, mortal. Moral injury. Wow. And so um, not survivor's guilt. It's something different than that. Something different than that. Moral injury. And so, you know, I just accepted that story. You know, um, I'm the soldier and I choose war. War chose me and pain chose me. And I'm going to hold on to the warrior ethos and everything that I do will be based on war. And, and now I'm holding on, I'm holding on, I'm not letting go. And I'm not allowing goodness to come and flow through because it has no room for me because I'm holding on to the fact that war is my fault. Mm. This is now my life. And, but then something happens. Then someone comes along and says, that's not your fault. And for whatever reason, something inside of you says, yes, that's what I've been whispering to you for a very long time. And I had to learn how to not just let go, but there are some times where I had to literally pry my fingers apart from holding on to that pain, that hurt. And now in my life, I'm like, you know what? It's time for me to not only let go, 
but it's time for me to live. It's time for me to share the other side of me, you know, Boy. the fight, the fight to be happy, the fight to say, you know what, I have a voice. I'm more than just war. I know how to love. I know how to heal. I know how to put together and not just take apart. This is who I am, and I know how to shout it out loud without yelling at you, but letting you know that I have something to say. I'm here. I'm present. I made it, and I made it not just for myself, but I made it for my battle buddies, and I'm singing their song too. It's not just about me. And I am cheering. I'm a cheerleader, but I'm also getting cheered. And this is what it's all about. This is life. And we have to sing that out loud. And this, that's my story right there. Thank you. Wow. So beautiful. Thank you so much. It's so beautiful. Oh, I just need a minute from that. Thank you. Um, Sabrina, so you've talked about how your wife had a baby recently, the most beautiful child you've ever seen in your life, Wolfie, and how through that process, you sort of learned a little bit about why the patriarch is holding on so tight. So why don't you give me a little bit of what you learned by watching somebody else go through having a baby. Well, yeah, so we had our first baby two years ago, or she, she had it from her body. Um, but I travel around and collect applause breaks for it. So it really it gives me, it's like, it, I know what it's like to be a dad and it's chill and it's like it's it's hard to see other people's discomfort when you're comfortable like the patriarchy or like toxic masculinity it's like sleeping on a king size bed your whole life it doesn't matter how many women come up to you in hijabs all walks of lives all different pe women being like you know we're sleeping on sleeping bags your first reaction is going to be like okay cool so we're all sleeping <laughs> um like Shauna was like super pregnant and I wasn't, I just didn't have that experience so I didn't know, like we were in the back of a lift once on our way to our friend's wedding and uh, she was just like, you know, organs rearranged, like, like feet swollen, just bursting with baby. I was just like drunk, stoned, listening to Drake. <laughs> we're both doing our jobs. And, and I had this like true epiphany where I was like, babe, this is the easiest pregnancy ever. <laughs> and she was like, I wanna push you out of the moving car, you monster. But like, that you only know what you know is what I now know. You only know what you know. Like she, when she was super pregnant, uh, had her like final way in before she gave birth. And she came home and she kept on saying, she was like, babe, can you believe I'm 150 pounds? Can you believe it, 150 pounds? And I was like, no, bitch, because that's been my goal weight forever. <laughs> no. What does it feel like, flying? No. No. <laughs> I have a minute left, so I'll tell you how we made the baby. I highly suggest this. Uh, took a surf lesson in Mexico. My surf instructor, gorgeous, skin like mine, hair like mine, face, beautiful, just like me. Like yours. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just looking at him and just like, I don't know if you guys have taken a surf lesson, but it's just 90 minutes of just staring into a man's eyes, just brainstorming ways to ask for his jizz. <laughs> In my experience. <laughs> anyway, he said yes. And we do, it, we, we do it in an Airbnb, like he does it in a cup, he leaves, very economical. Procter & Gamble, we should put these kits together. I put her in a syringe, we make love, I put her in Shauna, like we made this baby like the way the Lord intended. And, and now everyone looks at this baby, this is the beautiful part, people look at this baby and they're like, Sabrina, it's crazy because Shauna carried it, it's Ricky's sperm, like, but it's so crazy, like it looks just like you. And I'm like, no shit, I'm the executive producer. <laughs> That's my minutes. <laughs> By the way, the sequel is coming soon on this, so stay tuned. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I've heard you talk about your grandmother and your mother, and um, tell me a little bit about what you learned about worthiness and strength from being part of that intergenerational motherhood. Yeah, I come from a long line of Southern black women who say inappropriate things. Um, and I love it so much, you know? My grandma has a way of just 
saying sort of a backhanded compliment to you, but you receive it with love. Like when I see her, she'll be like, oh baby, you look so good, but next time you go to the gym, do some of these. <laughs> do these right here. And I'd be like, what is this lady saying about my midsection while she hands me fried chicken, you know? <laughs> I've been doing my genealogy and I got back to my fourth great grandparents and I found an ancestor named Caroline. She is free and a landowner in 1850, wow. before emancipation. Wow. Wow. And when I looked at that and just you know, traced her down to all of these women that have helped me become who I am, it encouraged me to remember that my words are important to write and to say. And it encouraged me to remember that names are important and pronouncing the names correctly is important because I get back to my fourth or fifth great grandparents and I start losing their names because now they just become Negro, male, eight on a census. So it helps me to remember that that's why I'm writing. That's why I stand on stage with confidence because I owe it to those women to do it. Mm, beautiful. Well. That's the, that's the perfect point to say, go stand on the stage and Yay! give it up to those women, please. So uh, this poem that I'm gonna do, I originally wrote when I was in Rwanda and I was there watching these women uh, doing all these amazing things with babies on one hip and water and baskets on their heads and it just made me think about all of the amazing uh, women of color that I know that have empowered me so well. And when I say women of color, I mean black women, indigenous women, Asian women, Latinx women, and the work of those women all over the world, how sometimes their work uh, gets erased, or sometimes their names get erased from their work and other people's names get put on top of it. And I wanted to write a poem to celebrate the amazing work women of color are doing all over the globe. Uh, so here is this poem for the women. We carry water on our heads babies on our backs, joy in our hips. We till the fertile ground in our garden, in our soul, in our children, we grow. We watch things grow, we yield fruit in season. We stand in front of fire, in front of desk, behind camera, behind pulpit, in the face of war. We face evil, we face violence, we face obstacles. We stare struggle in the eyes and dare struggle to stare back. We take the last bit of flour add water, make tortillas, make porridge, make naan, make dumplings, make biscuits, make do with hands that knead the dough and build the bricks and teach the children and fight poverty. We carry a community in our wombs, in our chest, in our arms, on our backs. We gather our words together like so many sticks until they ignite. We build fire and around that fire we sing. We sing because a song always gives birth. We sing because a song knows where the soul is wounded. We sing because a song reminds us we are always at home in this body, in this skin, and around that fire. We dance. We dance to the tune of liberation. We dance for the women who have gone before us, for the women who are no longer here, for the women who cannot speak. We will dance and fight for justice until every woman is free. Hear the drums and the rhythm we want walk, as we speak in our mother tongue, as we say prayers in our mother's tongues, we find our language in banana leaves and avocado and rice and yams and seaweed. We tell our stories while braiding the hair of our daughter or building a business or going to school or performing surgery or frying chicken because nobody needs to tell our stories for us because our stories belong to us because we belong to each other. We raise our hands. We raise our voices, we raise the next generation, we create, we invent, we pioneer, we look ahead and see no path. So we use our feet to build one for the ones who will come after us. We leave a legacy in the sound of our laughter every day. We build a world. Thank God for women. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. That was amazing. That was incredible. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. Okay, guys, you're in for the hugest treat ever. Please welcome Michael and Tanya, otherwise known as Warren Treaty.
Hi. Um, while, I, while serving in the military, um, something pretty cool and unique happened for me. Um, after one of my commanding officers was killed, I wrote a song and I performed it for his memorial while out at the war and it brought a lot of healing and clarity for the troops and the general decided that that would be my job for the remainder of time of service, uh, to go around and write songs about the fallen, perform them at the memorials, and bring healing to our boys and girls. Um, but in the midst of that, I wrote this one particular song uh, just to remind me of home and remind me of good times. I would stare up and look at the moon, and I thought the moon was so pretty and so beautiful in such a war-torn, ugly situation. And I'd like to dedicate this to you all um, because um, I'm no fool to believe that all these beautiful faces and smiles um, are constant always. So I hope you can remember this in your time of, of ugliness that um, there is beauty out there. Thank you. A yeah, pretty moon Bright and fair How do you hang In the air up there Look like you hang oh, oh, Free From all Find a way 
to stay up high. You find a way to stay up high. Wow, all the stars fall by your side. Thank you all so much. 
We're so grateful. If you leave here with one thing, please remember you have a story and it matters. So please share your story, listen to others, and together we can heal and change the world. Thank you all so much.